Okay, you can start now. Okay, uh, so hello everybody. Um, I can, uh, I hope you can hear me uh, properly. Uh, everything works fine. Uh, I would like to welcome you on today's seminar, uh, which is focusing on Czech pirates, um, mainly on Marcel uh, Kolaya's. Um, everything is fine. I can hear some voices. But hopefully everything works. So um, I will just continue. Uh, we will focus mainly on the media relations and, and uh, Marshall Square policies, but I will also tell you something about the Czech Pirate uh, as such. So uh, once again, my name is uh, Boris. Uh, I'm Marcel PR expert. And uh, on the other side, there is, there is Tomáš Adamec, who is uh, um, uh, assigned political advisor, helping Marcel with the uh, legislation. So let's look on the outline, what we will be talking about today. So first of all, I will tell you something very briefly about uh, the history of Czech Pirate Party. Uh, I'm confident that most of you know what is, uh, what is all about and what happened in the past. Uh, but uh, just for you guys who are kind of new or uh, just don't know um, uh, so many information. Uh, the second part will be about the media landscape in the Czech area and pirates. So what is specific for Czech Republic and uh, how pirates fit in this larger picture. And the third and the main part will be about the Marcel themes, which is uh, my, my part when I will be talking about the communication and media, how we are managing the work, what are the channels, what are the topics, etc. And Tomáš will later on tell you the most important part, which is the policies and legislation. And that's basically the thing, uh, uh, the weird thing why the guys are in the European Parliament. So yes, uh, we've got a, um, a packed schedule. Uh, it should be around 60 minutes. Uh, our part will be around 30, 40 minutes, and then you have, will have questions. If you have any questions right now, you can write into the chat, and we will answer them later. So um, that's the outline. Let's look on the Czech Pirates party. Uh, I created this uh, five parts, let's say, um, history. Um, so Czech Pirate party was founded in 2009, 11 years ago. Uh, it was and it is still a grassroots movement uh, with, a, with a clear goal, uh, making Czechia more digitalized, transparent, and also democratic. Um, and a year after that, uh, there was already a um, opportunity to uh, like somehow see if these uh, values and uh, and program will be successful in the elections. But since it was a young party, they received just uh, over uh, uh, like under 1%. Uh, three years later, it was 2.66% in the national elections. And in 2014, it was almost 5%, uh, which you need in Czech Republic to get actually to the uh, national parliament, but also to the European parliament. Uh, so unfortunately, pirates didn't uh, succeed. But it was a huge motivation that uh, they are growing steadily, and it makes sense to somehow uh, stand on these, uh, these values. So two years ago, uh, finally, Czech Pirate Party made it into the Czech Parliament, uh, gained almost 11%, 22 seats from two, 200 uh, uh, seats in the low chamber. And a uh, year, uh, year and a half ago, um, me and my, sorry, my and Tomáš um, Boss, Marcel, uh, as a leader of the um, candidate list, uh, won the elections to the European Parliament with almost 14% and three MEPs. Uh, so that was the history, and uh, this year, 2021, uh, we are going to have a parliamentary elections in the Czech Republic, and currently it seems like uh, pirates are going to be the second largest party. There's also a discussion with merging, or not merging, but uh, candidating together with another party, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite uh, close um, on the opinions, and that would mean that they could even be the first one. Uh, here you can see opinion polls since um, January of the last year, and the black line are pirates. So you can see that now the, the conservatives are the third one currently, the, the blue line, and they are um, falling down and pirates are going up. So it seems like that they are going to have around 20%, which is, which is quite cool on the party, which 
10 years ago has just 0.8%. So yeah, there's, that, this should be at least, at least this should be a motivation for you guys to um, work on uh, spreading the buy rate values in, in Germany. Uh, so let's look on the Czech uh, media landscape. Um, I put here like five points. Uh, they are not, um, let's say, objective uh, reality, but something that I see from my point of view as a, a media person. Uh, I see Czech media as uh, a bit con more conservative, at least when comparing to Germany, um, but it's not as conservative as in Poland or Hungary. Um, I mean, we are not, uh, the, the media as such are not against abortion, um, or LGBT uh, communities, um, but still they are like anti-migration apart from Eastern Europe, uh, because that's something different from the, the people's and media point of view. And uh, therefore they are also focusing on negative rather than positive change. So this is something which is resonating in the Czech media landscape, like rather uh, it's like in all media landscape, but especially in the Czech media landscape. Um, and it's also connected to the fourth point, which is kind of provincial thinking close to change uh, and also like Eurosceptical. Um, um, and that's somehow, from my point of view, defined by history, because there were like in, in the past several um, events which uh, cons conserve us or how to call it that we should take care of ourselves as Czech Republic and not uh, thinking about what is going on outside, outside our borders. Um, so, and this is also somehow um, in the media landscape and um, the way how journalism works. Uh, let's go quickly through the history. Like after 1989, the Velvet Revolution, uh, most of the media were um, uh, were formed and then owned by foreign um, foreign owners, especially from from Germany. Uh, this changed in 2008 because until that time. The media were something to gain money from. I mean, m many of uh, the owners were just, okay, just keep doing your job, do it as, as uh, best as, as you can. And we are just uh, focusing on if you are making us money, that's it. But after 2008 and uh, the crisis, um, the Czech media were not anymore making any money. But what happened was that they, they got influence. Uh, so, um, the people who needed influence can actually use them to um, uh, win anything uh, they want. And that's what happened. And I, I bet like all of you know this uh, uh, with our prime minister. Uh, in that time, he wasn't. He was minister of uh, finance, so not even a politician yet. But he bought a huge complex of, of media and he's still owning it. Uh, not officially. He made some, I mean, he created some kind of, you know, back doors, but still. Uh, he's using this conglomerate or this structure um, to put information throughout um, the media uh, landscape uh, environment to the people. Um, so, so this is like a really um, fast overview. So first 20 years, the media landscape was a bit more open and a bit more uh, free. And now it's getting like every huge, uh, every huge, not only politician, but also uh, uh, entrepreneur have its own structure of media and uh, they, are, they are using it um, on, on each other in case something happens. So uh, um, unfortunately it happened. On the other hand, we have two media in the Czech Republic from my point of view, which are uh, doing a really great job, Czech Radio and Czech TV. Um, they are not state owned, but state controlled, something like BBC in the United Kingdom. Uh, so and, and the kind of problem is that they are controlled by the same people uh, that the media are referring about. So prime minister is controlling if the Czech, not, not directly, but throughout through his um, uh, member of parliament, if the Czech, these, these two media are doing a good job, which is kind of weird and shouldn't happen, but it's happening. Um, but still these two media are doing a very good job. And uh, at least when I'm looking on the Czech uh, political landscape and media landscape, these are um, two things that make me happy. <laughs> uh, also, after the um, uh, 2008 and uh, the crisis, uh, many of the journalists uh, made their way um, to, to other media or created a, a new media. You can, you can see many of them here, even the Czechoslovakian, uh, something called Denik N. And uh, all of these guys were like against 
oligarchs, especially uh, prime minister, which is on in the right corner, and uh, for freedom and, and democracy. So uh, there are currently like two camps. Um, the, the old media, who are from the huge part owned by, uh, I mean, businesses or politicians, in case of prime minister. And on the other hand, the, these like small projects, in many cases, like very um, op opinion, for instance, Echo 24 is like, right, not right wing, but like really conservative. Um, and they are trying to do a the journalist job, the, the something that media should be doing, like to be a, um, What's the, what's the proper English name? Yeah, the watchdogs of democracy. Um, yeah, so this is the situation, or this was the situation, and right into this, um, the the pirates came, into the this, this illusion of the Czech voters when the media are owned by politicians and they are doing whatever they want. Um, the pirates came with a new style of politics. Um, as I already mentioned, it, they say grassroots movement, uh, but for most, it is um, data-based, consistent throughout the time, which is not something uh, really, um, uh, let's say, standard in the Czech Republic. Hardworking, and that's, that's objective. And also, um, uh, they've got authentic marketing and public relations. I will show you um, more um, in the latest, latest slide. But some things maybe which are for Germany like quite normal, and you, you guys perceive it as, okay, this is the standard. Um, this is something that pirates in the Czech Republic came, came with and are still like holding this um, benchmark or how, how to call it. Like they, they created from my point of view, a new kind of standard. Yeah, here you can see, uh, for instance, on the, in the left corner, uh, upper corner, um, there is, uh, the, or there was uh, in, the beginning, in the beginning of the Corona crisis, a collection of computers for kids. Um, so they are not only somewhere there in Prague in the capital doing politics, but they're also helping the, the little people who, who like really need um, to educate their, their, their kids and uh, and doing stuff. So um, this is some 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 kind of a new mindset in the Czech politics. politics. And also uh, in the left down and, and right down corner, you can see the um, the face, the main face, and the head of the Czech Pirate Party, Ivan Bartosz. Uh, with the dreadlocks and um, I mean on the one hand he's really working hard as I already mentioned but on the other hand on the right side he's you know the guy one of us um, he's not a son of someone someone rich or he didn't get to the function because um, through some you know um, backdoor discussions but because he's transparent and the pirate party as such is transparent and they are really um, always showing voters what they are standing for uh, which was also different uh, kind of attitude back then and it's still uh, so pirates are kind of unique um, at the communication before elections and let's say um, during their mandate but also the social media is kind of different and more, more authentic from from my point of view here is uh, in all the pictures the head of the Czech Pirate Party and you can see him you know with dogs jogging outside exercising with a cat like a normal guy um, and it's authentic. I mean, a lot of people, uh, especially at my age, just believe in it and believe that he's authentic. So um, this part of the communication of the pirates is also very important. Okay, and moving on from the Czech media landscape, pirates, <clears throat> and uh, we are now approaching the communication of, of Marcel, uh, our boss and the vice president of the European Parliament. Um, so first of all, I will tell you which channels we are using, and then I will tell you how we are creating um, the communication itself. Later on, you can ask me if you want um, the direct questions about the details, but now we will just go through. So basically, we have um, uh, three or two um, main channels, and that's uh, public relations and, and marketing. Um, so public relations uh, is basically that you are trying usually throughout the media to influence or let's say um, tell the other side what they should think or how they should perceive perceive you. It's not the direct thing such as marketing, which is you are telling somebody that my product or my party is good. 
And in this case, in public relations, we've got a weekly press releases. Um, sometimes we don't have anything, but usually we have at least like one or two, some, sometimes even three, depending on if there is any legislation or anything going on. Um, but also we've got a blog post on uh, especially COLA EU uh, website about what is going on in the European Parliament. And uh, lastly, we are also collaborating with the media. Uh, I bet all of you know uh, Everactive, it's, uh, or Euroactive, or how to read it in English. But um, there is a cooperation between the pirates and this media um, uh, when they are somehow referring more about our topics and we are giving, giving them a, a premium information. So press releases, blog posts, and cooperation with media or media relations, that's one part. And the other one is marketing. And we are using this, uh, especially on social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but also on advertising um, on online, in online media. Uh, it's not as common, uh, but it's also there as a part of the propagation. And in case of social media, the Facebook, it's more general, let's say. We are informing about um, more or less like everything what is going on, uh, whether there are like blogs, or some videos or some articles, uh, interviews, anything. The Twitter is more uh, ex expert. So there you can find almost everything in English and like deep in the legislation. And Instagram on the other hand uh, is something that it's just for pictures and informing the young generation about what is going on. So these are uh, two main channels. And to tell you something about the structure of the communication, how I see it or how we approach it in the beginning. Um, first of all, we define the topics. Um, Tomáš will tell you later on what is uh, what are they about, uh, or at least some of them. But the four main uh, cornerstones of the communication are the Digital Services Act, then artificial intelligence, um, transparency of the European Parliament, and media freedom. It's also strongly connected to the uh, committees in which Marcel is uh, uh, is a member of. Um, so when you define these topics, uh, what do you want? You, first of all, you need to have why, but we have this strong why because the pirate part is based on why. When you have this huge why, then you can put on it uh, the um, the defined topics. Um, later on, we we are planning like long term um, communication, which means that we. Um, that we prepare a campaign, like what are we going to inform the voters and everybody else about? And yeah, then then we um, then we um, like find the the channels throughout which we want to uh, this this message message to get to the voter, uh, whether they are the social media or the press releases or interviews in the TV, anything else. And um, you know, these are like short term goals that we are fulfilling. And lastly, we are reacting on what is going on. But um, to get a good communication with voter, you need to have a consistent informating him or her about what is going on. And sometimes just um, tell them about, okay, our opinion about, about this policy or this um, uh, foreign affair is that or uh, outcome of election, anything else. But um, in long term, there should be, uh, there have to be a uh, cornerstone topic, topics. You can see it also in case of Patrick, uh, which you are sticking with and which you are um, informing the people about on consistent basis. Um, doesn't have to be daily basis, uh, but at least consistent, you know, at least each uh, and every two days. Um, yep, so that was everything from the communication perspective. Now I would like to give a floor to Tomasz Anandes, who will tell you more about the uh, policies, and then there will be a um, block for you guys to ask you ask us uh, any questions. So thank you for now, and Tomasz, I would like to ask you for telling us more about the policies. Okay, thank you, Boris. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us for this uh, call and joining. Um, I would like to tell you something about uh, Marcel's work in the committees and uh, about his main topics that he's working on right now. So Marcel is a member of three committees at this moment, is the one on the, the main one 
uh, is the Internal Market and Consumers Protection Committee. This committee is very vast in terms of topics. So it deals uh, with issues about, for example, about tariffs, about pharmaceuticals, etc. But Marcel's angle is uh, mainly digital insurance regulation and AI. He is also the coordinator uh, in this uh, committee, which means that it's a person that is representing our political group in the committee structures, uh, our political group Greens FR. So the other one that he's a member of is a culture and education committee. It quite mirrors our activities in the internal market committee because uh, this committee is giving opinions on, uh, on a majority of digital issues, on a data strategy, on artificial intelligence, on DSA. And uh, well, this is kind of a, let's say backstage information, but uh, for example, in the internal market committee, there are members that are really uh, involved in the topic on digital from our political group. So they need to divide which topics who is going to work on. But in the cult committee, Marcel is perceived as kind of a digital champion. So anytime we have a file or, or legislation that is dealing with anything digital, and we just, there is written digital in the name, they will be like, oh, Marcel, this is for you. So in fact, we do a lot of work in cult uh, on those files. Uh, apart from this, we also work on the media freedom, which is something, uh, and pluralism, which is something that is quite urgent in the, in the Czech Republic and the whole Central Europe. Uh, Boris already mentioned it that uh, our Prime Minister Andrei Babish is he has a let's say he has an influence on a, uh, on the media companies which makes about 30 percent of all media market in the Czech Republic so uh, his influence in this term is very big there was an issue very recently that we were looking into that one of the Czech uh, state agency the National Railroads were uh, paying for the advertisements to to, to the media that are owned by Babbage, but not to any other medias, which in the long term, which is, for example, the case in uh, Hungary, can lead to the situation when, when this public uh, advertising is directed only to the, to the media that are connected to the leading party, that the independent medias are losing uh, substantial funding. Um, the, another thing that Marcel is dealing with in this committee is digital education, which is something that kind of uh, surged in the last year uh, in, because of the pandemics. Work on this issue is a bit specific because the uh, European Union doesn't have a full competence in education, which lays in the hands of national states. So we kind of need to find a way how to address those topics. So we mainly focus on the issue of, uh, in, of digital infrastructure. So, for example, if the students that are now participating online, if they have access uh, to the Internet in case they live in a rural or distant areas. We also try to look in the, into the issue if they have access to devices as such. And uh, a big issue is also digital skills, for, especially for the teachers, so they are able to, to teach the students online. The third committee that was established last year and where, member is, uh, where Marcel, Marcel is also a member is a special committee on artificial intelligence and digital age. Uh, it's quite a common practice in the European Parliament that in case there is some kind of a societal issue that is very urgent at the moment, the Parliament uh, establishes a special committee that is dealing with this phenomenon. So, for example, in the past uh, legislative term, we had one on the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, which was uh, about tax evasion and, uh, uh, and avoidance. And in this term, there is the one about artificial intelligence, there is the one on uh, animal transport and cancer, and I think there is one more as well. So, this, those committees work works in a way that they have a mandate for a year, uh, it should consist of uh, hearings and uh, fact-finding missions to the national states, which, given the situation nowadays, could be a bit more, more, more difficult. And in the end, the committee will issue one report on, the, on this issue, and it will represent kind of a political will and political opinion of the parliament on the artificial intelligence as such. So, and uh, as was also already mentioned before, Marcel is also vice president of the European Parliament. He's responsible for the... Oh, we can maybe come back uh, in the presentation up. Uh, I will get back to the artificial intelligence afterwards. Uh, he's, a, he's a vice president responsible for the ICT, which was again a quite urgent situation in the last uh, year because given the pandemic and uh, the lockdowns, we had to somehow secure that the European Parliament is still functioning, that the committees are still taking place and then the votes are possible. So it was solved in a way uh, which might not seem super innovative, but in the end, the members were uh, allowed to, to vote via emails. So basically, they received a voting list, they fill in the voting list, they print it out, scan it, and they send it, sign it, and send it back. 
what was Marcel uh, pushing for is to make every single vote a roll call vote, which means that you can see for every single vote if the if the member voted in favor, against, or if he or she abstained, which is normally not the case. Only like some specific uh, in some specific cases, this is uh, it does in, in the, this is done in this way, but the other votes are are without indications. And the reason for that was because it was sent, on, was sent by an email back. There was a need for the members to check it if, if their vote was uh, counted correctly. Uh, also, there was another situation that was, uh, that was with the voting systems in the committees where the parliament wanted to implement something which was called iVote. And it was a system that the parliament developed and it was functioning only on, uh, on Apple devices for voting in the committees. Uh, why, why, iPhone, why Apple devices is because the European mem the members of the European Parliament when they come they all receive iPads, and uh, there was also an opposition towards that because members have uh, have the iPads and they can uh, work with them, but not all the stuff. So there was a bit of limitation for us to access the voting list and uh, the voting system as well. And also the issue was that if you want to use this system, you had to accept the terms and conditions of, uh, of Apple. Uh, the other thing that he's focusing on in the, in the parliament is the transparency uh, of the parliament as such, where uh, maybe if I can compare it uh, between the council and the parliament, I think we are more far ahead because uh, you can see the committee meetings online, you can see the plenary online, such a, but in, in the council, nothing is online, nothing is, uh, everything is in behind the closed door. And also he's, uh, he's looking into the issue of the transparency, how members are spending money that are given to them. So we can move forward. So uh, about his topics that he's dealing with, the, the biggest one nowadays is the DSA and DMMA, Digital, Ser Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act. Uh, those regulations were published just before Christmas. So basically we have, it, we have them for a few weeks already. Uh, just to briefly, tell you about the procedure, how it went. So in the February last year, there was a white paper published uh, on those topics, which starts the political discussion uh, from the side of the commission on, on, on this issue. The European Parliament prepared a few reports where they expressed their will and the commission partially implemented it in, uh, in, their legisl in the legislation proposal that they published now before Christmas. Based on our experience, we now expect that the whole legislation, whole legislative process should go for more or less two years, which is quite important for us because as Boris said, there is a possibility that the virus will be in the government in the Czech Republic. So if everything goes well, the final, final stage of the whole process should be in the, in the end 2022, when the Czech, uh, Czech Republic has the presidency. So it means that the Czech Republic will preside trilogues and negotiations between the council and the parliament and the, and the commission and they should be held by the by checks by pirates so fingers crossed let's hope it's gonna happen because it would make our work probably easier uh what are those files about so the digital services act is the reform of the e-commerce directive from 2000 which was the which was setting the rules how the internet works um well we can imagine it's a bit outdated already because uh, in 2000 in 2000 there was not even facebook and uh, another platforms that now kind of dominates the internet so there was a need for a long time to make a new new rules and new legislation which came now um there is a huge pressure to set this right i mean it's not just because for our citizens and uh, for our businesses but also what we learned from the gdpr is that since european union is such a big economic and political power and other states have a tendency to to issue or to 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 implement very similar or at least inspired by us legislation so, for example, on GDPR, there is a very similar legislation uh, uh, implemented in uh, in Brazil and in, in India, for example, which of course for them is important. So it's easier for their companies to enter our market and also to open uh, up their markets for our companies. About the main issues that Marcel is uh, going to focus on in DSA, so one of them is a micro targeting and behavioral advertisement. That's uh, we have a big discussion on this how we should approach it. Commission wants to go for higher transparency in this topic, which means that basically uh, when you have a, for example, on Facebook, you have advertisement based on the commission, it should be visible who is paying for the advertisement, why is it uh, tar targeted to you and to which group is it targeted. We think it should go a bit further. 
we are talking maybe about the ban of those practices completely or to, to put some stricter, strict regulations. For example, in terms of political advertisement, we think that there should be, if not banned at all, there should be at least a minimum amount of people that the advertisement is shown to. So we can avoid a situation when some kind of disinformation or fake news is shown to just 100 specific people. So then we can set the rule that this kind of message, this kind of advertisement must be shown at least to 10,000 people. And then it would not be so target, or it would not target so much the people that are, let's say, deep in those uh, disinformation rapid holes. Uh, what is what is there? Another thing is the no general monitoring obligation, which is the principle that was already anchored in the e-commerce directive, and now it's going to be stressed again. It means that national states cannot impose any kind of a mechanism to monitor the, the internet in their countries. It's well, it's very good that it was uh, restated again, but we are a bit uh, well. The thing is, we are not really happy about this because we are also counting on a ban on filters, which is not part of the legislation. And it's something that we will want to probably uh, bring up during the negotiations. Another thing is about the notice and action mechanism. Uh, that means that we believe that the, the decision what's going to be deleted in the platform and what's going to stay in the platform should depend only on the court and never on the platform itself. Why is that? It's because uh, we can have, a, of course, illegal content, which is very clearly illegal, such as uh, pedophilic uh, pornography or terrorist content. But on the other side, we have something that might be perceived as a, as a bad content by one side, but it's not illegal ones. So we can imagine we have some kind of conservative platform and there would be some kind of nudity on it or LGBTI content. So the decision if it's going to be taken down or not, it should always lay in the, in the hands of the court, not the platform as, as such. Also, we want to push for that the platform has the obligation to publish in a transparent way how many, uh, how many posts and how much of content was deleted uh, from the website and what kind of content was that. So the user can always think of if the, if the website is uh, doing maybe some censorship or not. Um, then we have a uh, rights for anonymity. That's something that was in the file that we are not really happy about. And it's the specific case when uh, you found an illegal content online and you want to announce an abuse. Uh, based on the provision that is now written in legislation, you should provide your personal data to process this request, which we think uh, is something that needs to be changed. Uh, there is already an exception. I think it's for uh, for the, something related to the child mis misabuse, but we think that it should be a broader exception or it should not be even part of the legislation. There is another thing that was a huge debate before Christmas about encryption because some member states wanted to push for uh, an exception and breaking of end to end encryption systems such as WhatsApp or Signal because of they wanted to make more effective the way how to fight terrorism uh, and arranging the terrorism, terrorist acts on, in those platforms. And we were expecting that maybe something would appear in, in this to preserve, preserve the end-to-end -end encryption as we know it now, but unfortunately it didn't happen. There is nothing about encryption in the legislation. In terms of the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, this legislation deals with the position of the big players in the market. So well, if we make it really simple, it focuses on the big players such as Facebook, uh, Twitter and others, and how, they, uh, how the competition uh, works in the in the digital space. So the issue that Marcel is strongly focused on is the interoperability. I uh, see I have a typo there. Um, so it means that he wants to have uh, an obligation for the platforms and uh, for the chat systems to op cooperate between each other. So in case you, for example, want to use a Facebook, but you still want to be in touch with your contacts and your friends that you have on Facebook, you should have a way how to use another communicator to reach out to them. Another thing, uh, apart from communication and chats, it's imagine that you don't use Facebook and there is some kind of a harmful content about you published on Facebook and you want to announce an abuse to have it deleted. So again, there should be a mechanism for you to have this possibility without finding, uh, find, without uh, having a profile on the platform. So that is the, the main things about the DSA and DMA. Uh, just maybe one thing that I forgot at the beginning, it's, uh, we already know it's a regulation, which means that uh, in the way that it's going to be written by 
uh, it's going to be written, it's going to be trans transposed to the national legislation. It's not a directive. So then we can move to artificial intelligence. That's uh, another biggest topic we are dealing with right now in, uh, in both, in, well, in all three of our, our committees. It's, again, it's a very broad topic uh, because it touches on, on a lot of aspects of the artificial intelligence. So we had a report on the uh, intellectual property rights of the uh, artificial intelligence, on the ethical aspects about liability, etc. There was uh, really a lot of reports. And uh, now we are waiting about how it's going to, the final legislation look like. We still don't know if it's going to be regulation or directive or just a recommendation. This, everything is still unclear. We should, if everything goes as it's planned, we should receive the, the legislation, legislative proposal in this quarter or the next one this year. Uh, so what are the biggest topics that we were, uh, we were addressing in the report that we already worked on in the European Parliament? So one of them is a ban on facial recognition behavior detection systems in public space. There was even a, well, there is, in fact, there is a campaign running out by our Political group that is raising the awareness about this issue in a, in the broader public. Uh, I already mentioned that in the February there were the white papers that were opening the debate. So there was also one on the artificial intelligence. And before that we had the we had a leak about a few weeks ago that was a bit touching and uh, on this idea of banning the facial recognition. But then the moment when we received uh, the or, the original text, the correct text this information was gone. So it's something that we are pushing now and uh, we are waiting for the rationale of the commission because the commission in the end decided to delete it from the, from the proposal or from the, sorry, from the white paper. Um, there is a very good study about the uh, facial recognition systems done by Fundamental Rights Agency. I think it could be a bit outdated already because it's from 2019, but it was studying uh, where those systems are used in Europe. So based on this study, the biggest amount of those systems are deployed in, uh, in the UK, which is not the EU anymore. But there was also a part about the usage of those systems in Germany, which could be interesting for you. So there were some tests around in Berlin in 2017, 2018 in the train stations. Apparently there were areas when it was deployed and they were marked. Like this is, this, this is the part of the, <laughs> of the station which is under surveillance of, this, of those cameras. And uh, well, I don't know if it's true, maybe you would know more about it. And the justification why they wanted to proceed with those uh, cameras was that the enforcement uh, authorities are not able to process all the cameras and to watch it uh, at the same time. Uh, there was another one case in uh, Hamburg in uh, July 2017 when those cameras were used in the, during the G20 summit. The angle that we are taking because well, apart from info, we also touched on this topic in a cult committee, which has in its remit also media freedom. So we also pushed this idea that it would be very harmful if those systems were deployed in public for investigative journalists, especially in a country such as Hungary or Poland, when you would want to do your reports and your investigations and those systems, well, it would be very, very difficult. And we kind of found a support for that among uh, our political parties. So. Uh, fingers crossed, let's hope it's, this debate on this is going to get a bit further. Another thing is that we are talking about the ban of those systems on the public spaces, but we don't have a very easy definition of a public space because, for example, a good example is uh, King's Cross uh, train station in London, which could be, could be technically public space because there is a lot of people passing through, but it's owned by the private entity. So is it public space or not? So it's another debate that we will have to have. In Prague, just to give you a full picture of the Czech Republic, uh, we have those cameras uh, used in the, in the airport. And there was an attempt to put them also to the subway in Prague, but uh, since pirates are in charge of Prague, they were in a position to this decision, so at least it's postponed, it's not uh, deployed yet. Another thing that we are dealing, uh, dealing with is the discrimination, which is also connected with the transparency of your training data sets. So imagine that you have a systems that you want to use for Mm, evaluating CVs, for example, in the HR department. And uh, you always need to teach those systems on some kind of a data set. So if you have a very theoretical situation that we would want to make a system that will detect a good leader and we will feed them with the data from uh, year, year zero until today, the system will probably think that the good leader, leader is a man and it would 
actively discriminate against women. So this is something that you of course want to avoid. So we are suggesting that all those systems that are used should be auditable at every single stage, which means that uh, there should be an access for the public authorities and the civil society to check if the system is not actively discriminating against anyone. Uh, one of the ideas that we are always pushing through is that uh, open source solution is the best fit uh, how to achieve this. Another thing is the, is the algorithms based on the automated decisions that are used, for example, in uh, internet platforms on Facebook, etc. Um, there is a there is an issue about the rights to opt out. So this thing on Netflix, when you are watching, imagine that you are watching, for example, something about the people that believe that the Earth is flat, and then you will receive another conspiracy theory, and again and again, and you might rec you might end up in some kind of a rabbit hole of a transparency. Uh, oh, sorry, of, of uh, conspiracy theories. So that's something you want to to avoid, and you want to have a very easy way how to opt out from this. Also, there is an issue of the right for human oversight, which means that there should be always a possibility for you to reach out to, to a person in case you don't agree with the decision of the, of the algorithm, in, for example, in the, in the content that is recommended to you or in the chat box, etc. Um, about the recommendation system, there is another issue, and that's, uh, that's the thing of the burden of proof. So at this point, you as a user should always be the one that is gonna prove somehow that you are being discriminated against but it can get very tricky in terms of those uh, in those situations because i will use a, it's a it's a czech example i would say uh, so imagine that there is a company that is selling a very luxurious flex and they basically make an advertisement on facebook and they put to the criteria that should be shown only to the people of a, uh, like a, how to say a wealthy background etc and it might be also very possible that they would mark that it should not be shown to people of Roma origin. So then when you're the Roma person that is looking for a flat, you would not even see the advertisement. So it would be very difficult for you to, to even realize that you're being discriminated at, at, this, at this moment. So that's the reason why we want to push for the reversal of this burden of proof so the company itself should prove that they are not discriminating against anyone, not vice versa. Um, there was another debate in our committee, it's about the intellectual property rights for the artistic content that is generated by AI. Uh, well, very brief, very shortly, we are against it. We don't think there should be another copyright uh, created for, for artistic pieces that are generated by, by artificial intelligence. Because uh, as the law goes now, we always give those rights only to human entities, not, not to machines, not to animals. So we don't think there should be a change in this. Uh, uh, in this perception of the intellectual property rights. Mm, yeah, I think uh, that will be the main, uh, the main issue of uh, both files. So in case you have another questions, just ask me and we can talk about it further. Okay, Dimash, thank you very much for the policies. I'm back and if you guys have any questions, then we will welcome them, so feel free to ask us anything about the media or or policies that Marcel is uh, currently working on. Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure if um, all of you can speak or just write into the chat, but both, both options are okay for us. Hi. Um... First, uh, let me thank you for your time. Um, then I got uh, one question related to PR, and that is um, um, you talked a lot about which media you use and what you use uh, what media for. Um, um, I would be interested, uh, what is the target audience you're going after uh, with your PR? Is there like um, a stereotypical a person that you are writing your press releases to? Um, or is there a specific demographic you are target targeting? And uh, then for uh, Tomas, uh, the question, um, how is it possible for pirates uh, from Germany uh, to interact or uh, or give input uh, on those topics. Is there any kind of um, open participation which they can take part in and um, maybe learn to interact with parliament legislation? 
Thank you. Okay, I guess my answer will be shorter, so I will start. Um, um, yeah, the thing is that the pirate electorate, it's, it, it used to be, especially in the beginnings, uh, very niche and, and young and city-based. Uh, so that's like the one of the main still uh, audience that we are targeting, um, young people uh, uh, with a degree and, and in the best case scenario, uh, tech savvy. But um, as Tomas, Tomas already mentioned, there, there is uh, the, the mayor of Prague, uh, uh, his name is um, Hrib, um, he's also from Pirate Party. So pirates are in the um, in the main body of Prague, they are maybe going to be um, uh, the, the formative party of the next government. And Ivan Bartosz, the head of the party, could be the uh, prime minister. And Marcel is vice president of the European Parliament. So, like the the party is now much broader, and therefore uh, we are targeting uh, rather a let's say uh, radius between like 30 40 years uh, from the cities. Um, uh, which are liberal, let's say, um, in in broader sense of the of the word. So yeah, I hope this answers the question. So, so the area audience is not niche anymore. It's not like one group, but it's rather a really um, wide range of people who are uh, like pro European, who are uh, for uh, our membership in the European Union. Um, and who are from the big, big, bigger cities. Yeah, so if, if that answers your question. But th thank you for asking. And uh, I guess Tomasz um, can now move on with the second question. Uh, thank you for the question. In fact, um, I might have a bit of a bad news, I think, because the public consultations are usually held before the legislation is published. So for the DSA and for AI, it was, uh, it was already in the summer last year. There is always also uh, the public consultations are also after the legislation is finalized. For example, now they are ongoing the, the one on the copyright, which where young pirates are one of the, one of the parties that are taking part in the public consultations. To be honest, from the Tip of my head, I'm not sure if there is going to be another public consultation now during legislative procedure. I would say no, but you always have a channel which is basically you can send the suggestions either to us or to Patrick's office because he's going to be working on a, on a DSA. I'm not for sure in a jury committee on AI. I'm not sure 100%, but I think as well. So at this point, it would be probably the, the easiest way for to participate. In the future, you can always. Uh, uh, look out for the public consultations that are always published on the site of the commission. And it's usually, as I mentioned, those white papers that you should start the political debate. It's also, it's not meant just the political debate with the parliament or national states, it's also with public. So there were the three white papers on the AI data strategy and the DSA in the last year, and all of them had the public consultations where the NGOs and the civil societies and also political parties can uh, can put their uh their comments so i would recommend that uh i've also seen in the chat the the question to be honest the topic of the encryption privacy it's more a patrick's topic and a frank's topic so i haven't uh, touched on this uh, recommendations so it would be very difficult for me to give any opinion right now but uh, i would recommend to just to try to ask uh, frank or, or Patrick directly because well they are experts on this on this one. We focus more on a, a bit different angle of the of the digital stuff. Thanks. Oh well, I hope the, I answered the question as well. Ah, okay, great. So yeah, uh, I would really recommend to wait for Patrick because uh, he's a master of encryption and uh, of security and privacy, so he will definitely know more than me. Okay, guys, is there any other question from any of you? Or I will also check the YouTube channel since that could be a question. But here is nothing, if I see it right. Yep. 
Okay, so any of you have any question? Yeah, basically you can, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Um, um, if you have any, you can, you can also ask like about the check pilot party or the um, pirate IMPs in the European Parliament, but if, if there is not, not many, many other questions, um, then I would thank you for your time and for listening, listening to us. In case you would have anything, um, the best scenario is, from my point of view, to approach us on. I mean, if, if there if it is something longer, then write us an email. Um, but in case you want to ask like a short question, then write us on Facebook. In case you have Facebook, and uh, yeah, if not, then just use the, the email. Um, yeah. However, thank you guys and uh, good luck with building the pirate party in Germany. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, hopefully the um, Czech Pirate Party will succeed in the alternate elections and that would be a bit for you. Rich. So uh, thank you for now and yeah, have a great evening. Yeah, also thank you for my site and uh, just to add, in case you have a question, you can also contact us via Metromost, we are all on it. So it might be even easier than, uh, than, than email or another channel. Thank you guys.